Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate your coming to this important lecture by uh, FRC's distinguished fellow, Dr. Pat Fagan. To those of you joining us online, welcome. We wish you were with us here in person, but we are glad you're joining us online. Dr. Fagan, uh, who I'll introduce in a moment, is one of America's most distinguished sociologists and works here at the Family Research Council as senior fellow and director of the Center for Research on Marriage and Religion. Before introducing him and his topic, I wanted to begin by reading a brief excerpt from this article that appeared last year in Newsweek magazine. It's called Only You, and You, and You. Polyamory, relationships with multiple mutually consenting partners has a coming out party. I'll read a very short excerpt. Teresa Greenan and her boyfriend Matt are enjoying a rare day of Seattle sun sharing a beet carapaccio on the patio of a local restaurant. Matt holds Teresa's hand as his six-year-old son squeezes in between the couple to give Teresa a kiss. Matt, his, Matt's mother, Vera, looks over and smiles. She's there with her boyfriend, Larry. Suddenly it starts to rain and the group must move inside. In the process, they rearrange themselves. Matt's hand touches Vera's leg. Teresa gives Larry a kiss. The child, seemingly unconcerned, puts his arm around his mother and digs into his meal. Now, if you followed that, essentially what this is describing is a polyamorous relationship between two couples, each of whose different sex partners are in an adulterous relationship. In the midst of this is the child of one of the couples. To read this article, if you have any sense of conscience, is to have your heart broken, if for no one else than that little six-year-old boy. Dr. Fagan today is going to be talking about essentially the crisis in American marriage as it relates to the culture of human sexuality taking place in our culture and in our country. I will let him explore that and describe the crisis as it is, but before doing so, let me just introduce you to Pat himself. Patrick Fagan is Senior Fellow and Director of the Marriage and Religion Research Institute here at the Family Research Council. Mary examines the relationships among family, marriage, religion, community, and America's social programs, program problems as illustrated in the social science data. A native of Ireland, which he recently returned from, Pat earned his Bachelor of Social Science degree with a double major in sociology and social administration and a professional degree in psychology at Diploma Psychology, as well as a PhD from University College Dublin. Pat started his career as a grade school teacher in Cork, Ireland, then returned to college to become a psycho psychologist, going to Canada to practice then to Washington, D.C. to pursue a doctorate in clinical psychology. In 1984, Pat moved away from the clinical world into the public policy arena to work on family issues at the Free Congress Foundation. After that, he worked for Senator Dan Coates of Indiana. I worked for Senator Coates, too, another um, thing that Pat and I have in common. Then Pat was appointed Deputy Assistant Secretary for Family and Community Policy at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services by President George H.W. Bush. He then spent 13 years at the Heritage Fellow, or I'm sorry, at the Heritage Foundation as a senior fellow, and then came to S FRC a few years ago, and we're not letting him go. <laughs> so with that, it's my great pleasure to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Pat Fagan. Well, thank you very much, Rob, and it's, a, of course, a pleasure to be here at home speaking. Um, I apologize in advance, I may cough because I have something <coughs> tickling me here. But today I'm going to talk on a broad topic, a big framing of what I think is happening in the United States, not only here, but especially here, we'll look at home. What we have now is uh, essentially the culture of the traditional family, it's now an intense competition, even a war, that's been declared by only one side, a side that has a very different, what I'd call, anti-culture. And the practical epicenter of this political and social storm is the sexual ideal. What the national consensus will be on that sexual ideal and how it is viewed, taught, and practiced. It has history-changing impacts on the personal, family, 
local, national, and global levels, and I hope to <coughs> unravel or unpack some of these. Now, Western civilization, which is the fruit of Christianity, in turn based on the Jewish faith, is based on and organized around lifelong sexual monogamy. That is, having a sexual relationship with only one person, a spouse, over the course of a lifetime. Now, it wasn't Christianity's intent to sort of build a monogamous culture, but the monogamous culture is the fruit of Christianity, and with it comes huge strengths. Now, the competing anti-culture, which is growing virulently, and has been for, I, I reckon, at least 200 years, is polyamorous, that is, serious, serial sexual relationships before, after, or instead of marriage. Now, there are major political players in this, uh, in this culture war. It has an expansive institutional infrastructure gradually put in place over the last 200 years. I reckon the beginning is around the time of Rousseau and de Sade. I'd say we're the two first big institutional players. Uh, the French Revolution uh, almost iconized the culture war with the placing of the prostitute on the high altar of Notre Dame right in the middle of the, of the, of, of the revolution. Fifty years later, Marx and Engels, Engels particularly, uh, really make it clear the war, the war on the family and on religion as the two big obstacles to the socialist state. In England, about 40 years later, you see it in the Bohemians, the Apostles Group at Oxford and Cambridge. At the beginning, actually, they were, if you trace the threads, those, they were the real motivators and instigation of the assault on sexuality in the Anglican Church that led to the Lambeth Conference. Trace that back from the Apostles to the Lambeth 1910, 1920, 1930 and the change there. At the, around the same time, you had Margaret Sanger beginning to do the trips back and forth across the Atlantic, some major funders, some big American uh, wealth got in behind her and began the institutionalization, the Rockefellers, later the Fords. And you had gradually the growth of institutions dedicated, and now we have massive amounts. They're probably, they far outstrip as it were, our side in their breadth, depth, and financing, um, institutions dedicated to this change of the sexual ideal. So I would put it back, starting with the French Revolution, or just prior to that, prior to the French Revolution. You could see the sexual revolution actually really did take place among the educated and the elite of the French court and the French intelligentsia prior to uh, the French Revolution and has been gathering a pace ever since. Now in this speech, I'm going to be using the term monogamy and polyamory really to refer to these two cultures as we highlight the difference between essentially Western civilization and its opponents. And we're going to highlight these particularly in the consequences of lifelong sexual commitment on the one hand and what I'm calling a polymorphous sexuality on the other. And I'm going to use the term polyamory and sometimes um, polyandry. Now, many people occupy a fuzzy middle between these two extremes. I think probably all, most Americans are probably in the fuzzy middle in between the two. But that in practice actually puts them on the side of polyamory, even if they regard themselves as being of the culture of monogamy. Uh, these are the people we have to reach so that we can essentially rescue America from itself. Now let's look at the choice before them, the two cultures, which differ in profound ways. Now the culture of monogamy is built around and protects the traditional natural family. In the culture of polyamory, the traditional natural family is just one option among many and often is considered a nuisance because of its claims to special difference and superior effectiveness. In the culture of monogamy, and this is key, men are anchored to their families and tied to their wives and children through the free and deliberate focus of their sexuality. 
Sexual, such sexual constraint by men and women is not expected, nor is any attempt to foster it such acceptable in the culture of polyamory. This is where the sexual ideals are very, very different, which at its core treasures sexual license masquerading as freedom, for such sexual restraint would be the antithesis of the main project of the culture of polyamory, a polymorphous sexuality when mutually desired by two or more partners. And Rob's introduction was well an illustration of that. The worship of the creator has a very different place in both cultures. The culture of monogamy is infused from top to bottom with the sacred in personal, family, community, and national life. The worship of God is frequent and assumed. The culture of polyamory, however, tends much more to hide religion and to suppress it in all things public. It worships God less and demands that religion be private. The culture of monogamy views freedom as the freedom to be good, while the culture of polyamory review, views freedom as the absence of all restraints on the self. And they are two totally different and incompatible views of freedom. In, the mor in morals, the culture of monogamy embraces universal moral norms, while the culture of polyamory embraces moral relativism, and that not just in the sexual. It spreads over into other areas as well. The language of virtue sits well with the culture of monogamy, but uncomfortably with the culture of polyamory, where some virtues, even such fundamental ones as chastity and modesty, are essentially held in disdain. In the culture of monogamy, and traditionally in Western civilization, laws protect by forbidding, outlawing certain actions. That's how laws work telling you what you cannot do and what you will be punished for doing. You're left free outside of that. The culture of polyamory, on the other hand, protects by prescribing programs, norms, and outcomes for all, no matter person's own choice. Very big difference between the two. In the absence of one, you have to have the other. Above the floor of the forbidden, what is not permitted, the culture of monogamy leaves all goals and actions freely available to everyone. It sort of makes clear the floor, and you're free above the floor. The polyamorous culture, having less of a floor, is not clear on what it forbids, cannot be clear on what it forbids, constantly increases the prescriptive and regulatory detail, having to tell people more and more how they must act. And we've seen recently in public policy debate, particularly on healthcare, massive illustration of that. And actually, a not only a reluctance in that debate, an emphatic denial of going into the area of what would be forbidden. They would not make clear what is forbidden. That was an illustration of that whole polyamorous nature coming in. And the sexual was right at the core of not forbidding certain things. The culture of polyamory denies personhood for convenience, even for the most innocent and vulnerable, the unborn, and the infirm, and thus, thus denying the law's protection of the innocent, the very foundation of justice. While in the culture of monogamy, the key function and the first principle of law and legitimate government is precisely the protection of the innocent. And that gets right to the core of justice, of law. In the culture of monogamy, all human life is sacred and protected. It's very interesting. Monogamy, the dedication of the man's sexual, uh, sexuality to his wife and his children, that it should go with the protection of life. In the culture of polyamory, about one-third of the preborn are killed by their mothers, and the handicapped, the elderly, are becoming less welcome and are increasingly vulnerable to talk at this stage of early elimination. In the area of government, most importantly, the constitutional state was the product of a monogamous culture. 
I contend it could never have emerged from a culture of polyamory and cannot survive there. And it has not emerged, such constitutional orders have not emerged in non-monogamous cultures. The culture of polyamory got its greatest boost in our country when the Constitution was altered in the name of privacy and a principle found in the penumbra of the Constitution so that the sexual norms of the country could be changed. And this change took place before Roe v. Wade. They were changed in Griswold in 65 and particularly in Eisenstadt in 72 when the Supreme Court legitimized sexual intercourse outside of marriage. That was the deconstruction of monogamy by the Supreme Court. Planned Parenthood was the agent of change in these two and also in Roe v. Wade. Another difference, the culture of monogamy assumes responsible citizens. The very act or the whole thrust of monogamy is responsibility. The expanding welfare social state, or the social welfare state, is built primarily on those who have not been sexually responsible, who have left marriage behind. Now, I don't say this in a blaming way, in a dis descriptive way. A lot of people have been trapped and seduced into this without knowing it. The culture of monogamy, by being child-oriented, is future-oriented and full of hope. The child is protected and the next generation, the future of the country, is the main focus of society's work. The culture of polyamory, the focus is on the present welfare, short-sighted welfare, and its main focus are adults, not children. Despite the denials of radical feminists, the culture of polyamory aggressively fosters the male they most decry the sexually and physically harassing and abusing and abandoning male. That's what you get from our US culture of polyamory. Being the natural cost of its defining project, these and related dysfunctions are accepted by them, but then used to justify and necessitate more safety nets and bigger bureaucracies. The degree of their attachment to their license is visible in the absence of the promotion of marriage, even their opposition to any promotion of marriage and abstinence. That became very, very clear during the congressional debates on abstinence and marriage programs. The culture of monogamy is the most protective of women and children, something radical feminists refuse to acknowledge, though the data is repeatedly clear and staring them in the face. They can't acknowledge it, or it would totally upend their project. In the culture of monogamy, men are not only anchored, they are required to be so. In the culture of polyamory, women are the anchors, while men can drift or be cast adrift as they or their women desire. And they do so in very large numbers to the massive detriment of their children, the mothers, and themselves. <coughs> now the culture of polyamory does cultivate strong girls, which is a good, but at the cost of weaker boys, which is not a good, but a great social weakness or evil. But the culture of polyamory is not upset by this. We have increasing numbers of constantly decreasing education attainment among boys and men, even as it increases for women. The increase for women is good, but not at the other cost. The culture of monogamy is more economical and effective in raising citizens with habits and aptitudes needed by society, especially by democratic republics, while the culture of polyamory only fractionally achieves and always with major unintended consequences. For instance, it's welfare programs and it's engendering of a permanent underclass. The culture of polyamory social policy is not working, while by contrast, marriage and worship are and do. They do massively so. 
Without social, it's social welfare safety nets, I contend, actually, the culture of polyamory will collapse overnight of its own weight and disorder. For the public purse, the culture of monogamy is inexpensive, and the culture of polyamory is very expensive, and depends on a, and constantly lives off a massive transfer of payments from the culture of monogamy. Dig into the data. The culture of monogamy is dedicated to self-sacrificing love, while the culture of polyamory is prepared to sacrifice the love of others for the gratification of the self. Now the big question is, is it possible for these two cultures to live together in the same political order? I contend they cannot. And eventually one, I don't know which one, will triumph over the other. The, the social orders underneath both are totally incompatible. One must triumph. Over and above the differences just delineated, two issues leap to the fore in their political consequences. In population, the culture of monogamy is fertile and expanding, while the culture of monogamy, or sorry, of polyamory, is below replacement and contracting. And secondly, the culture of monogamy is inexpensive, while the culture of polyamory is very expensive. Now, because of these two what I would call killer conclusions at the political level, and contributing significantly to the tension between the two, the culture of polyamory has, in my guesstimate of what's going on, has figured out its way to survive and even thrive by controlling four critical areas of public policy, which yield big gains in converts from the culture of monogamy to theirs. These four are welfare, childhood education, public school education, sex education, and the control of adolescent health programs. The fifth and sixth actually are media and, and the higher education. They're different areas. Controlling these expands polyamory culture's reach into the traditional monogamous culture and gradually dismantles it, especially when aided by the entertainment industry, which is a very powerful anti-culture institution at present, and positively it, because it positively portrays polyamory continuously while deliberately undermining both chastity and worship. That's a broad stroke characterization of the media, but I think people would agree with it. By using government to control these four areas, welfare, education of the child, sex education, adolescent health services, the culture of polyamory diminishes the influence and dismantles the authority and influence of parents, parents of the culture of monogamy, particularly in their ability to form their children as members of their own culture. One could say this is Deliberately, it's a bit provocative, but I'm doing it deliberately to make the point. One could say they snatch their children away from their parents and from the culture of monogamy. Uh, the historical analogy that occurs to my mind are the Janissaries. I don't know if you know who the Janissaries were, the Ottoman Turk Empire through the 13, 12, 13, 1400s, had devised a strategy by which, in expansion, they would attack the periphery. Uh, essentially Christian culture of, of Europe, and in doing so would raid and capture young boys, bring them back, and then make elite shock troops of them, who in turn, 15, 10, 15, 20 years later, are those who pushed it further and in turn captured more boys, brought them back, raised them as thing, and that's had, it was a very successful strategy, it's the Janissary strategy. I contend that's, by analogy, that's what's happening in our schools with sex ed, with the media. They have figured out how to capture our children. And the snatching is almost complete when these program areas result in adolescents accepting and engaging in sexual intercourse. You get that, you got the rest. Gramsci, the famous Italian Marxist, who had this 
great and devious and well thought out strategy of the slow march through the institutions. I don't think he got into this area, but some of his students, as were intellectual offspring, definitely have. Every time the, that a, a young adolescent decides to become sexually active, not to have sex once, but to become sexually active, and there are many programs in schools which would lead children to be so, uh, albeit not to get pregnant nor to get STDs. But once a child does, you get Engels' two goals are immediately achieved. The destruction of the family and of religion. Because teenagers who become sexually involved, well, you're going to have either out-of-wedlock births or abortions, destruction of the family even before it's formed, or later, by their mid-30s, divorce. Over half of them, 44% of, once a child has had two sexual partners, or once a woman has had two sexual partners, by her mid-30s, only 44% of those who are married will be in stable relationships. Over half will have divorced. So you get their destruction of the family, long term. Simultaneously, you also get the child stopping to worship. We know this, everybody knows this get sexually involved outside of marriage and you're not going to keep going to church. <laughs> now you might come back to church to repent and start again, but the two are pretty incompatible. The culture of polyamory achieves this without any, without any overt direct attack. It's silent, well, almost silent, subtle, but very substantive in its victories and outcomes. And they know it and they are fierce in protecting their control of these programs with a fierceness nothing in the culture of monogamy rivals on the political scene. Nothing. For instance, in the last decade, the rise of abstinence education, which is essentially monogamy education, immediately galvanized the institutions of the anti-culture of polyamory into massive counterattack, culminating in many victories when they eliminated a lot and Jean here could fill us in on the, the details, eliminating a lot of the federal funding for such programs, at least temporarily. This came to pass despite all the good that comes with abstinence, including reducing teenage abortions, out of wedlock births, sexually transmitted diseases, while simultaneously increasing education attainment. Since the 1960s, the culture of polyamory has led to a massive weakening of the United States through a weakening of its citizens in the five basic tasks that every society confronts, every community, every family, every marriage, and every individual. They're the task of sexuality, of religion, of learning, of income, and of governance. And this undermines all five. Normally we call these tasks the institutions of family, church, school, marketplace, and government. They are all weaker now, every single one of them. And as a result, we as citizens are less capable than our ancestors of these areas. We may have grown a better economy, but we haven't grown ourselves. Now how can the monogamous families survive and thrive in this postmodernist, polyamorous social welfare state era? Well, state-controlled programs today are, are universally, are polyamorous friendly and increasingly monogamous, monogamy hostile. From every perspective of political analysis, this is unjust because those who choose monogamy are the most effective, the cheapest, and the safest in raising the next generation. So there's a patent prima facie case of justice injustice. But it is unjust mainly because it is a universal, inalienable right of parents to raise their children as they see fit, including raising them in their culture. Also, every child has the natural, inalienable right to the marriage of his parents, because without it, he or she cannot reach their full potential as adults. Even more egregious, the social welfare state asks the monogamous to support the polyamorous and uses the universal safety net insurance schemes to ensure that they pay 
they pay more to support those who choose the path of polyamory with all its attendant and by now well-known weaknesses, even pathologies. How does that happen? It's very, very simple. Those who are married earn more. Those who are married pay more in taxes. The more broken the family is, the, the less the income, many of them not rising even into the taxable brackets, and increasingly there's a need for more and more services. So you get the income and the tax revenue here, and you get the need for services, and there's no uh, capacity to pay on the other side. So in effect, you have a massive transfer of payments. This is plainly unjust, but even more so because the monogamous do not have their own culture-friendly programs, and their own children are the target of the culture of polyamory's what I call janissary scheme. Justice will increase and tensions will decrease when the culture of polyamory, if it were made to pay its own way. Hmm? It couldn't, however. The presence or absence of the father is one of the great defining differences between these two cultures, and therefore, men who support monogamous marriage need to step forward to stand for the difference and to stand for their rights to their own culture. This is very much the role of men, not of women. Men are the warriors. Women are the nurturers who build the home and build the community. But it is to men to protect it. And in family issues in this country, ever since I've been involved, and I'm sure the men who are here often feel this, well, a lot of people feel more comfortable putting a woman out to talk about it. Well, and that's true, and it's good, because so much of family is about nurturing and raising kids and giving birth and all of that. But there is a real role for men, and it is to protect the family. Precisely because men make the difference, they need to be seen at the forefront of this competition. And they need to speak out about monogamy. There is a defining difference. I know this is difficult. It's totally anti-cultural. But it is the defining difference. And if men, the warriors, are not prepared to make clear the difference, there is no fight. There is no border to be defended. There is no territory. It's a cakewalk for the opposition. Their women and their children need them in the sacred core of the family. Society and their own culture needs them in the same way, but out front taking their fight for their culture right to the center of this discourse. Of course, I don't mean in any way to take a, a whit from the need for women and mothers to be involved in the same one. Every male in the monogamy culture, and especially every father, will find his own particular way, I hope, to be engaged in this protection of his children and his culture. The two are synonymous. And given what's at stake, all men and women of the culture of monogamy ought to expect this of every man. I think this is something I'm really addressing. I think we need to begin to think and step forward as men. Monogamous men will fight for control over what is his and his family's just due, what his taxes fund, and what they can use in raising his children control over the four big programs, and there are others that could be mentioned, but the four big ones of welfare, childhood education, sex ed, adolescent health programs, so that they're being carried out in a way that supports the norms of the culture of monogamy. In this rearrangement, all parents, even including the parents of the culture of polyamory, have the same control. So now we are tasked with gathering, planning, and exhorting each other and drawing to our side not only monogamous men, but all fathers of goodwill, particularly those who are in that sort of fuzzy middle, who've strayed into the culture of polyamory, maybe not by design, but more by happenstance or not being clear. For their children need them to rescue them from their mistakes, and they also will benefit from their parents having control, the same control over the programs. So the culture of monogamy and Western civilization have never encountered this type of competition ever before in all of human history. This is the first time. 
this sort of conflict has ever arisen at such an organized political level that there should be in contention the very nature of the family and of sexuality. We must engage it if we were to have minimum equality and the peace that comes with it. We must engage even more if we were to roll it back. And it's very clear, we can wait no longer. The danger signs are, the bells are ringing all around. So how do we start? We're looking for the first few. How do we go forward and strengthen the culture of monogamy locally, at the state level, at the national levels? This is the work that urgently confronts us. To address and change this weakness, I suggest we first get control of our own for ourselves, in justice, and by that very process, provide those stuck in the middle the example of how to be strong again. We need to target the main injustices which must be redressed for us. We do have to get control of schools. Parents have that right. It's the one area. I grew up in Ireland and loved coming to the United States. The sense of freedom that here was palpable. But one of the first things that struck me was that the one area where freedom did not exist and did exist right across Europe was in parental choice of education. Americans have been snookered on this one for a hundred years plus, and at a huge cost that has now made us very, very weak. So it's time to really get control of the schools as one of the highest political goals to be aimed for. And with it will come all sorts of other goods. We know that the <coughs> scores will increase, the graduation will increase, the costs will go down. <laughs> the culture of polyamory is more effective and cheaper. Control of all sex ed given to our children. As a matter of fact, the ones who need the sex education are the parents, not the kids. <laughs> because the parents are the experts in sex. Family is all about sexuality. It's the institution that harnesses sexuality. And the parents are the experts. <laughs> they brought the kid into existence through the sexual act. So if there's sex ed needed for anyone, it's for the parents so that they can transmit it to their children, not to the children. There's a total inversion here. Control of health care. We need doctors who have taken a vow, binding vow to the Hippocratic Oath for the whole of their lives in all circumstances. We need doctors we can trust on matters of health and sexuality. And we need a defining difference between those doctors of one culture and the other so that we can make the choice clearly. We're not denying anybody their freedom. We just say, be clear, tell us who you are. So we can make a choice. Make the choice yourself too. The monogamists need their own doctors, they need their own medicine because it's very different in matters of sex, of life, and of death. And that's what medicine is mainly about. But to pull all these reforms off, we must also reform ourselves. And I think the first reform is needed right within the church. The churches, right across all denominations, are extraordinarily lax on the issue of chastity, and of marriage and the stability of marriage. So the restoration of the defense of chastity by men in public is, is key. But also actually there's another part that needs to be developed and it's not too well known and I think it's uh, up to scholars to do this. The data is tentative but very indicative that monogamous men and women on the sexual ideal, which is what is the whole, as it were, tempt temptation by which the polyamorous culture snuckers those to its side. The great unknown secret is, is that the monogamous have the most sexual intercourse and the best sexual intercourse. The Laumann data, which is the best survey out there, indicates that. Our kids don't know that. <laughs> Actually, it's good to tell the, uh, my first reading of the Lauman data, the, the book when it first came out, looking through some of the charts, I realized, wait, no, it seems to me that, you know, it's monogamous women who worship weekly have the most sexual intercourse and the best. Uh, but there's a slight difference between Catholics and evangelical women. And evangelical women had, what was it, 
I, I forget which one it was, you have both the, the frequency of sexual intercourse and the intensity of enjoyment, the orgasmic enjoyment of sexual intercourse. And evangelical women were higher on one and Catholic women were slightly lower. Let's say it was on frequency. I think actually it was on orgasmic enjoyment. But Catholic women were slightly higher on the frequency and just uh, evangelical women were slightly lower. So depending on who you are, now I'm Catholic so I can afford to draw this conclusion. So my advice to young men is find an evangelical woman who's become Catholic. <laughs> I know if you're evangelical, you'd say it the other way around. <laughs> Marriage reform is critically needed in the black church. Critically needed. I don't know how to say it to them. I'm not black, so that immediately puts me at a massive disadvantage. But it is a scandal to Christianity. And by scandal, I mean it is a stumbling block, a massive stumbling block. If early Christians were known by the love between them, Christians of today have to be known, I think, the, the big issue today, it's, and it is a deep aspect of love, will be known by their chastity. Because chastity is the great way to love, the love of the spouse, of the husband or the wife, and the love of the children. That's why one is chaste so that that love can be permanent, trusted, unquestioned, and forever giving. In our universities, actually coming back to the scholarly, we need to develop in the economic sciences uh, a bit more, making clear the intimate connections between marriage and the economy. Actually, it's one of the things Wall Street doesn't realize, but it exists on marriage. If you look at the data on where the wealth of the country is, the ordinary wealth is in the married family, both the married and the step family. And after that, there's a massive drop in capital, capital wealth. Marriage and worship together have profound strengthening effects on the economy. Both have profound effects on the growth of small businesses, the major employment sector of the major economy on earth, the source of 80% of the growth of this economy is small business. And look at small businesses, overwhelmingly their family businesses, overwhelmingly still their married family businesses. The whole area that's unexplored and exploited, but critical to an understanding of uh, the, the economy. And there actually our libertarian brothers in arms or occasional brothers in arms are totally blind on this. And economics is one of their great strengths. They need to look deep into that. If they don't agree, challenge it, fine, let the data out. But I'm very certain of the way it's going to turn out. I see an old friend here who's an example. He's an entrepreneur, a married man, dedicated, and all the rest, and, and employs. And this is repeated thousands and thousands of times. The gro economic growth of the country, 80% of it comes from small businesses, not the major corporations. They're almost like the, the core, as it were, the, the stable part, but the growth part comes from small businesses, comes from families, comes from entrepreneurs. So returning to the theme of men, developing a culture warrior mentality in our men and our women and raising our children to be culture warriors, like nothing the human race has ever faced before, like nothing Christianity has ever faced before. For never have had we to contend or to confront democracies going sour before. Well, in our history, we do, our founding fathers were very aware of democracies going star, sour, and they studied them. But the soft underbelly of human nature actually is the sexual. Every single one of us can easily be tempted, and probably most of us fall at some stage or other. But the coming back is the critical part, trying to stay true and on compass. So both freedom and peace need the virtues that flow from marriage and worship. Without them, democracies will become cisterns of conflict, corruption, and war. And we begin to get a sense of it now. I remember James Davidson Hunter, a famous sociologist of very high repute, 
one of his early books was Before the Shooting Begins. It was his analysis of, and this was written about 20, 30 years ago. Well, I think we're closer to the shooting now than we were then, because you can just sense it. The violence has increased, the political oppression is, is tempting. Um, we can get a sense now of the correctness of Mother Teresa when she warned that abortion will be the cause of war. You know, from such a saintly person, I can't take, at, at the time I couldn't follow the thread of her logic. I can see it a little bit more clearly now. That it's the sexual gone wrong, of course, is the whole cause of the abortion. With that comes all sorts of violence. So we need warrior men who will protect their families and their children, who will demand and get justice for their families in education and health and sex education, will demand a rearrangement of society if that needs to be, so that they first can preserve their families and then so that they can win back most of the rest to a good way of life. Now such men will be tough and tender, they'll be tender in their families, and tough in their public stance particularly when confronting the culture of polyamory. We've got to find the ways, we've got to be savvy, we've got to be, but it's going to need a toughness. We need to be protective of our own, working to win back the middle. Such is the work that lies before us, and I think it's best achieved bottom up. We here at Family Research Council, of course, do a lot of top down, as it were, because we're, our task, a lot of it is to do with Congress. But for most of us, it'll be achieved bottom up, first at the very local level, within the family, within our neighborhood, within our church, and then at the local and state levels. This is where most of us live out our lives and where the services are delivered in schools, hospitals, and doctor's offices. There is a culture war. We, the protectors of family and children, need to organize as we have never organized before. The Tea Party has given us a model, but what's at stake is much bigger than just big government. What's at stake is the fundamental institution of the family. Thanks very much. Pat, thank you so much. Usually after these lectures, I find myself with one or two questions. I have about 20. That was a sterling example of um, a fine mind at work. Thank you. I will ask one question, as I always do, taking the moderator's prerogative. You used a very intriguing phrase right at the beginning of your lecture, anti-culture. It's, would you, um, would you agree that in the absence of some kind of conspiracy, there nonetheless is a profound hostility and antagonism toward the family that is animating some of the polyamorous movement? Or is that something that is more inferential than deliberate? Well, uh, there's three or four questions packed into that one. <laughs> Let me try and unpack. I think I call it an anti-culture because there are many different cultures through human history. Uh, but cultures tend to be, while they change slowly, as all things do, they embody the wisdom of prior generations where peoples of whatever culture, whatever ethnic group, whatever time in history, whatever religious background they have, they've sort of accumulated the wisdom of the generations before and figured out a way to live that optimizes life as their experience gives it. And that to me is what culture is. When you attack the sexual and for the sake essentially of sexual license or the enjoyment of that or putting that at its prime, you actually upend all the patterns you upend the economic, you upend the familial, you upend the religious, you upend the educational. So in that way, it's anti-culture in the sense that there is no good, there's no accumulated experience to be handed on that makes the next generation stronger. It's anti-culture in that way. Um, and what was the other part of your question? <laughs> 
do you think it is a is it simply a cultural movement that's pervasive or is there is there an overt hostility toward the family that's animating polyamory oh i think there's an overt hostility um maybe not to every single person but to to the natural family, to the traditional family, and very definitely to the natural family that is in, embodied within the Christian or the Judeo-Christian norm of monogamy. If you take, actually, if you take Rousseau and de Sade, who I put, you, I'm sure you can go back further and find others before them, but to me, both of them and in their writings, uh, both were very hostile to the family. Um, Rousseau, not necessarily, not in everything he said, but when you put the sum total of what he did, he's almost one of the first to put himself forward as an ideal, and his family life was the very opposite of idyllic. He was an abandoning father, uh, he was polyamorous, uh, and de Sade, of course, was even more so. <laughs> well known, he was the, the guy who sort of dug deep into perversions and sort of, but promulgated them and had quite an influence. So. There's a real hostility there, and and I meant it when I said that while I don't think this was delivered, it was more spontaneous, but it was spontaneous of the thrust of a lot that was going on in the French, not all by any means. There were real economic things that had to be, uh, economic injustices that had to be worked out. But the part of the thrust of the French Revolution, this libidinous license desire, the anarchic, with the putting of the prostitute on the high altar of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, you can hardly think of a more ex existential insult to God and to Christianity than that. And, and that, that came out of somewhere. <laughs> it's definitely sexual. Yeah. Question? Thanks. Um, this is a great lecture. I I wanted to ask you about one thing you said about the culture of making weaker boys, which I agree with, but stronger girls. And I have two daughters, one's in a public high school, one's at a Catholic college. You see them both battling this culture that you're talking about. And I don't really think this leads to stronger women or girls in the end. I think it creates a sense of entitlement. I can do anything I want to, and if not, I can get out of it. You know through it be abortion or whatever, the government will come save me. And I don't really need a husband either. That's what I see. And I don't think that's making stronger women. I, I agree with you. Um, what I had in mind, actually, is on some of the outcomes, you see girls are doing better. And girls do better than boys in that circumstance. Because you have a strong woman. You may not like all of the strengths, but you have a strong woman who's taking care of her children. And the girls are getting that modeling while their brothers have the modeling of an abandoning father and have no male model to copy, no strength being put into them, as it were. And you see this again and again and again. And it's very clear, actually, in the how boys and girls are doing in school. Now, I haven't seen a disaggregation of the data. The macro data is very clear. Girls are doing better, boys are doing worse. That's it at both the, the grade school, the high school, and the college level. I haven't seen a disaggregation, I see Nick Zill, Nick may have done this, of that data by single family versus married family kids, whether the boys and the girls and the married family essentially are all doing, sort of not with much difference between them. Um, on another thing actually where the polyamorous is, will have huge different effects on boys, and this is in, actually in adolescence and early manhood that the, like boys in growing up, you go through the different stage and in the latency period 10 to just prior to adolescence, um, boys by and large don't want to have anything to do with girls. Uh, and then all of a sudden they flip and girls become the most wonderful thing God ever made. <laughs> and during that period of life, uh, from adolescence through early manhood, most men become very attracted to a particular woman and they see in her the ideal. Not necessarily that they can get her, but they desire her, a particular woman. They sort of, sort of said she's beautiful or she's good or they like her personality or the way she walks. She may be unreachable for them, but they dream about her and they would do anything for her. That can, such girls and such women 
have a huge effect back on the boys, particularly if they get close and begin to get friendly. The girl can draw huge efforts out of the boy. He will climb mountains, he will build buildings, he will, go, he will do anything to win her, as long as she's chaste. Boys won't do that for a girl who's sleeping with one guy and then the next guy and then the next guy. Uh -uh. Such women don't draw the man out of the boy. But the chaste woman does when the man falls for her. So the, the whole relationship between the sexes in its natural way with the chastity and the monogamy brings forth strengths that can't be brought forth in the non-chaste, in the polyamorous. And that has huge effects on learning, on effort, on, also, on health, and all the rest. There are huge health costs and all the rest to the rest. So there's, um, you're, you're right. Such women are not strong. The, the, the polyamorous women are not strong in everything. But they are strong in their selfishness. And they raise strong, selfish girls. That's a too broad a brush. That doesn't hold to all things. But that's the drift. And of course, boys, some boys can work their way out of it by circumstance. They're lucky to have an uncle or a, a Boy Scout troop where somebody takes care of them or a neighbor and all the rest. But that's, not the, that's a tiny portion of the boys. The natural order is the boy needs his father. That's the man who will invest in him. That's what he needs, not the neighbor. He, it's great to have the neighbor. And actually, given the level of family brokenness, actually, we're all going to have to take on a second task, not just the defense, but actually the befriending of broken boys. There's just too many of them. Their fathers aren't around, so those of us who are concerned are going to have to take on more. We're like a listing ship. We've got to keep going forward. To rectify it, we need, we need to invest more in other families. Question? All right. Uh, you talked about at first a little bit about the um, a lot of people being snookered into the culture of polyamory, and and I would think that um, you know even most Americans today even wouldn't um, put themselves in the polyamorous category if given a, a choice. Sure. Would, I mean, so you know probably more likely serial monogamous. Um, but so I mean, would you say part of the the problem, the challenge that we have would would be that um, most people within the culture of polyamory don't know they're there? Yeah, and I think actually the main fault here is the church, church, synagogue, mosque, because this is where the definition really takes place. To be Christian is to be chaste, or to struggle to be chaste. I'm Catholic in confession, and I'm I can tell you. The confession of adolescence has a huge amount to do about faults and chastity, but that doesn't matter. The struggle to be chaste is a huge part of it, and the ideal is kept. Uh, and if, if Christians no longer see themselves as chaste or required to be chaste and need to struggle on that, it's the soft underbelly of every man and woman, and the left knows that, and they exploit it out the kazoo. <laughs> Every single one of us, and myself included, and I'm not saying I'm chased from here to the day I die. I hope I am, but I can tell you there are going to be a lot of temptations between now and then and lots of possibility of falling. So the, the whole thing of that is key, but the churches no longer preach that, require that of their men. And if the church won't, society is totally lost. There's nowhere else in society you can turn to to, to get that preached or that ideal held out and constantly held out and how to do it. So we do need, uh, the reform is first and foremost deep within the church. It's not the gays. That's a natural byproduct of, of the fallout. It's the church. It's marriage. Uh, and helping each other. And there's all sorts of brokenness where the, every family, at, at least in the extended form, is broken. Like we're all broken. <laughs> <laughs> much more broken than our, our ancestors were. So that's just taken for granted. We're all weak, we're all falling, we're all recovering alcoholics of some sort or other. But the need to recover is unmistakable. And to follow Christ, and that's really what it comes down to, is 
He was pretty clear on that. Actually, you go back to, he's most forgiving. The woman caught in adultery, the woman at the well, Mary Magdalene, most forgiving, and will turn on anybody who's not forgiving. But at, once that's done, very firm. Very firm. Why? Because it's so central to existence. The nature of the sexual act is about bringing the next being into existence and then being ready to, <laughs> to take care of that. You can't go deeper in material biological life than the sexual without immediately, from there you get deeply into the trinity, the theological, the forever, life after death, life, death, <laughs> and why it's all there. So it's right at the core. So that's why he's both, because we're very weak there, I think that's why Christ was so forgiving. Why it's so critical is why he's so firm. <laughs> he got the tenderness and the toughness at the same time. One more question. I've been thinking about the term the fuzzy middle. And uh, just from practical experience, it seems a bulk of the fuzzy middle are actually parents who, if you ask them, they would say they're in the monogamous traditional uh, culture side, but when it comes to their own kids, a lot accepting cohabitation of you know young adults or um, going with the culture where little girls are all made up and have makeup parties and sure. dress parties. And I wonder how this message is so powerful. How do you, how can you reach that those people? parents and give them permission to really stand up for what, at some level, they probably really do believe? I can't give you a comprehensive answer. <laughs> you know, this will bubble up in all sorts of ways as people become aware of what's at stake. Um, you know, how you handle TV, there's a real need for TV. I remember one good, good man putting it that, uh, you know, parents let come into the into the living room, what they would never permit to come within a million miles of the front door, you know, right into the intimacy of the home and what their kids see and all the rest that you'd never permit to come to the front door. Uh, the whole fashion industry, for instance, is a whole area for, what do I call it, positive, <laughs> positive growth. <laughs> that you have beautiful women dress beautiful. Look, men always love to see women dress beautifully, huh? Right, guys? <laughs> we live for it. We love it, what it is. But the fashion industry today exploits the flesh of the woman, but doesn't put much or anything into the, the craft, the art of beautiful dress. And women love to be dressed beautifully, and thanks be to God. There's a great complementarity of the sexes here. They love doing it and spending money on it. The guys love to see it happen. <laughs> you know? So, so there, there's a whole industry there to be revived, but a modest one, and the modesty in dress and all the rest. And this is how, actually how I think it's very important. Young women call forth the best from men, and they do. The young, the young woman has the capacity to make the boy out of the man. And why do you think we complain about the 20 to 30 year olds who are going nowhere? Because the women don't call forth from them, huh? There, there's a deficit on both sides. But you're dead right, I think this, this fuzzy middle, because it's, it's all so fuzzy, the other, the, this culture has penetrated so much in so many ways that um, it will take a lot of sharing, of thinking, and of gradually rebuilding how we protect but it's not just protection, not just pushing the bad stuff out. You have to grow the stuff in the middle that you want to because we need recreation. By the way, there's a huge difference, in, and this, I think, is deeply related. A big difference between recreation and entertainment. Recreation is mainly with other people. Entertainment is where you get lost. Now, I'm not against entertainment, but you can see where I'm heading with the digital entertainment, the capacity where we can get lost in that, and families can, rather than, if you leave that aside, how do families revive themselves, have a good time, have a good weekend, and all the rest? It's by getting together, having dinner, having a bit of a party, or having aunts and uncles, or whatever. You know, but it's people together enjoying people. So that's even a part of it. Um, there's so much to the question you asked. 
but it is the, the regrowing. And the, here's the core thing. The culture of monogamy is a culture. This is a culture built around the license on the sexual or the, a totally different view of the sexual. This culture is very different from that in all sorts of ways, not just in the political things that I talked about, but in those intimate things you're getting to. On family life, this is why schools are so important. Entertainment, music, dress, friendships, bars. The ones you go to, the ones you don't. Huh? I'm Irish, I love a bar. You know, give me a Guinness and that's where we have great recreation with others, <laughs> not digitally. Um, a great difference in that, but growing, regrowing this culture, but with confidence, not with um, defeatism, not with concern. Ultimately, actually, within the next hundred years, which of these two will prevail in the United States? I don't know. The jury is very definitely out. The other side is doing rather well, <laughs> put it that way. But eventually, the other will die out. It'll collapse of its own weight. You can see that in Europe. It's easier for us to see it in Europe because we're standing back a bit. European peoples are dying out. And they've totally embraced this culture. <laughs>